the lecture series with SOM, we have uh, two architects, one from Chicago and one from San Francisco. Jim DeStefano from the Chicago office and Mark Goldstein from the San Francisco office. Jim DeStefano attended uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and received a Bachelor of Architecture there in 61. He's licensed in eight states and he's a corporate member of the American Institute of Architects. He joined SOM in 1961 and in 64 he was elected a participating associate and in 67 he was elected associate partner and in 73 he is now a general partner for SOM. Mr. DeStefano is currently involved with the Illinois National Bank Project at Springfield, the Reinhardt Building for the offices of the Superintendent of Public Instruction at Springfield, the Woodfield 76 development at Scham Schamburg, Illinois, and Penn Landing Project at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mr. Goldstein from San Francisco received a Bachelor of Architecture and a Master of Architecture at Yale University. He is licensed in California. He won the Magnus T. Hopper Fellowship at Yale in 58 and 59 and was a Fulbright Scholarship winner to Italy. He is a member of the American Institute of Architects and is an executive committee member of the Northern Chapter of California. He joined SOM in 61 and it was, became a participating associate in 63. In 65, Mr. Goldstein became an associate partner and 1971 became a general partner. Uh, currently, Mr. Goldstein has projects in uh, Mauna Kea, is that right? Mauna Kea, Hawaii, the uh, Australian Mutual Providence Society Complex in Australia. He worked on the Bank of America World Headquarters in San Francisco and the Capitol Mall plan and the Pennsylvania Avenue plan in Washington, D.C. And now to start, Mr. Goldstein. Get my wire. Um, I'm going to talk about a building, and I think Jim is going to talk about that we've done in San Francisco. And um, <clears throat> Jim will be talking about some planning work out of Chicago. And I hope the evening will be a kind of balanced one. Uh, the, the, um, the material that I brought with me is really kind of uh, very low-key stuff. Um, the building is a large building that was completed about three years ago. But the point that I'm going to try and make tonight is there are a couple of different ways of presenting the building. There's a, there's a very sort of intense, high-powered uh, presentation in which we talk about the structural system and the elevator system and the technology and on and on and on, all of which is very true. But there was that whole other part, which is simply designing the building. And what I did was simply to go through a lot of slides that I had at home, uh, little models and drawings and things did in the course of uh, about three years of design development. And uh, I hope to demonstrate that a lot of the work that is actually done, say, in the school environment, is really what you do when you get out and you finally have to make the drawings and build models. So I don't mean to apologize for the, uh, for the uh, simplicity of this show. I just would like you to understand uh, my intent. Let's start with the first slide. The building is the uh, Bank of America headquarters building in San Francisco. Uh, it's the largest building in San Francisco. It was, as I say, completed, I believe, about 1969. Uh, our office was involved in it for about three years. There was another office which had been actually uh, was the, the initiator of the project. We came on board about a year so after it started. Um, quite simply, the project is an office tower, which you can see here, 
in the banking pavilion, which is the uh, functional main branch of San Francisco, and in a sense, the symbolic center of the bank. Uh, this is a uh, as-built uh, site plan. Uh, there are really three components to the project. There is the tower, which is in the upper right-hand corner. This is known as a plaza plan. There is a small, a relatively small banking pavilion that's actually uh, uh, in itself a very uh, uh, elaborate building, but uh, relative to the tower, it's a smaller part of the project. And lastly, a plaza. Uh, this section through the building kind of in indicate its uh, scope vertically. There are a couple of uh, underground parking levels, uh, which incidentally, were we building a building today, we would not be allowed to build as much as we're discouraging. Uh, automobile traffic to the center of San Francisco. Uh, substructure design provision on the left, and then of course the tower on the right. Uh, the typical floor of the tower is serrated at the perimeter, which uh, gives the, uh, what some people like to call a bay window uh, effect to the building. Uh, the uh, basic structural system is rather conventional rectilinear frame, except for the perimeter. And the building is served by a rather conventional uh, elevator course there, uh, basic system service spaces. Um, with these first slides, I wanted to define basically the project that uh, evolved. But now I'd like to take you through a series of slides of more or less how it evolved. When we came on board, the uh, concept had been set and accepted by the bank to the extent that there was a tower, uh, which did have a serrated perimeter. Uh, the material selected was a polished granite, and that there was a small pavilion at its base. Um, there was a joint venture of uh, three other architectural firms, and for a variety of reasons, uh, that <coughs> joint venture was disbanded, a new one was formed, and we became a, a part of that. Uh, initially, we were approached our office in San Francisco was approached to participate because of our technical capacity of being able to put together as complicated a building as this in a short period of time. We took the position that um, if we did come into the project, it would be uh, at least on an even basis in terms of design, that we were, were not interested in simply doing uh, work and drawings for a building which was, in essence, designed by somebody else. So. What came out of that was a joint venture in which uh, both parties, the other architects incidentally were Worcester, Bernardi, and Evans, located in San Francisco, uh, had equal design say, and when there were conflicts, and there were quite a few, uh, they were um, more or less moderated by a third uh, member of the joint venture, or actually a consultant too, who was Pietro Belusky. Uh, this is an early presentation model of the scheme as it existed when we, when we uh, came on the scene. Uh, there were quite a variety of technical problems in terms of the structural, mechanical, and elevator systems of the building, which I won't go into here. But I might just point out some of the problems which we saw visually, um, and which we stated to the bank before we have got involved, and, and I, I simply assumed that they shared our feeling, and that's why we did become involved. We felt that the building did not come down to the ground properly, that there was a very kind of timid relationship and, and an unresolved one between the lower, the lower pavilion and the tower, that there was a kind of, there was a kind of schizophrenia you know, in the design. You know, one building was sort of beginning 40 feet above the ground and going up, and then there was another building going down. Uh, the plaza seemed to us to uh, be, the intent of it was, was fine enough in that it was to be a fairly informal space, and yet because of the very nature of the scale of the two buildings, uh, our feeling was that it was an opportunity actually to create a fairly formal uh, plaza and none existed in San Francisco at the time. Uh, I think, again, this slide emphasizes, at least in our view, were some of the uh, visual weaknesses of the, of the uh, project. 
Um, aside from those, and aside from the technical ones that I mentioned before, there were some basic sort of functional or, or uh, functional dysfunctions. Uh, that underneath there is a very complex uh, set of activities, and they weren't very properly related. So, among the very first studies that we that we well, again, this I think uh, perhaps shows well, shows part of the problem. Uh, the first series of studies that we did was sort of this below plaza uh, organization, and I won't dwell on the details of it, but we arrived at what we call the concourse uh, concept, which is a simple axis uh, with, around which all of the activities were organized, and uh, it really made quite a bit of sense and was accepted immediately. In addition to concentrating on the, the um, activity functions below the plaza, we also took a very hard look at the, at the tower, and this is simply the last of a, of a very long series of studies that we did on the tower. We, um, to actually do that, I was searching for a slide, I didn't have it, we actually constructed a system in which we had two braces, and there were a series of diamond-shaped wooden shafts, and uh, the shafts were movable, so that we were able to reconfigure the top and the bottom of the building, and it was really a very kind of intriguing game that we Played. And finally, after looking quite seriously at about a half a dozen schemes, elected essentially the one that you see here. Um, which we felt, and I think if you remember the first slide, this is pretty much what the uh, quality of that of the image is on the, on the skyline. Uh, in addition to sort of looking at the base functions in the tower, we also did a series of studies of the pavilion. Our, our, uh, our point was that we, whatever the architecture was, A, it should stand on its own, on its own relative to the tower, uh, rather because of its high symbolic import, and B, that the architecture should relate to the tower. Uh, this was just an early scheme which, which clearly did not relate to the tower. This is another. And this little box was actually the germ of the building that was finally built. And, um, I guess what I'm really trying to say here is that this is where a lot of the very key conceptual thinking was at this point in time was occurring. And the tools we used were really very simple tools. They were just plain cardboard and we just got out of the way everybody does. Uh, finally, it took us about three to four months of, of uh, pushing and shoving a lot of different things. And the scheme did come together. Uh, this slide is actually backwards of a uh, clearly delineated pavilion, which you see here on the lower right, a tower, which as you'll see in later slides, we felt had a unified attitude and way it sprung from the ground, continued up, and then hit the sky. And lastly, a, a much clearer statement about the plaza. Uh, this is a companion drawing. I apologize for the image, but I think you can, you can see the intent of unifying a tower in a small building. Uh, the material is basically uh, polished granite, which was quarried in uh, North Dakota, very beautiful reddish-brown granite, and uh, dark uh, bronze glass. Uh, this was a, an internal study model that we developed, having among the joint venture architects and, and our uh, immediate contact with the client, we, we sort of set in on the scheme on the basis of the material you saw, and then further refined it for our own purposes uh, with this um, cardboard model, which I think begins to demonstrate again uh, really where the architecture was going. And having taken it to this point, we then felt that it was ready to, uh, to show the board of directors and the managing committee of the bank. And I think this next, yeah, this is the, the uh, presentation model that we developed, which is comparable That's to the that. first model that you saw. Which is, uh, in other words, it, it took us about six months to come back to the same point that we began at. Uh, one change that was made actually midstream in the model was at the top of the building, and it actually masses out um, symmetrically. Uh, these more or less do themselves. I show them simply as a, an example of the uh, level of detail that we felt in this particular case uh, would, would uh, be required for, you know, to communicate this uh, to the bank. Very frequently, we do not go into this elaborate presentation. 
uh, result in this case was necessary. And this then being the, uh, the back of the billion. Having sort of gotten through that very key decision, we then sort of recycled the whole building. And this, again, is one of a number of study models that we did of that lower concourse below the plaza. This particular model was a lighting model, and the different colored circles actually are symbols of different lighting fixtures and uh, the way we were playing with light in the concourse. Uh, this is one of innumerable, very simple cardboard models that we made to arrive at the, um, at the detailing system, uh, which in this, in this case was a very uh, heavily textured um, hammered concrete in the, in the concourse. And uh, this happens to be a little study that we did for one of the safe deposit counters. Again, there were literally dozens and dozens and dozens of these models. We, we, uh, Everything we did, you'll see further in the level of detail we did in model form. And if you can, uh, if you have the time to do it, that's clearly, clearly the way to go. Uh, this, and these, of course, were all simply built by ourselves in the office. This is a model coming up from the concourse. It's a half model of the lobby of the tower, uh, scaling the columns, positioning escalators, things of that nature. So again, you can see how simple it was. We would work. <coughs> At that scale, we we're also, as we develop further, where this happens to be a model of a mullion, mm -hmm. put a piece of glass, put it into it, and this is a handrail uh, connection. And what I'm really showing you are the, uh, generally the designs that were chosen. Uh, needless to say, in a case like this, there were, uh, even to get to this model form, we would build three or four of them. Sometimes we hit it very quickly, there was no necessity of doing that. But generally, we took a, a great deal of care with, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly rare that you have an opportunity to uh, to lavish this kind of attention, and when you do, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, we also uh, were working with the wall. We did a series of studies. Uh, this is sort of slightly out of sequence. This is a little cardboard model we did of a lighting of a, of a light fixture in the lobby ceiling. Uh, this is one of a half a dozen models that we made of the. Um, stone railing around the building, and it, I think it's a very successful a very successful part of the design in general is a kind of harmonious quality of, uh, of form. Uh, perhaps it's, it's even obvious to point out that the, the vertical stanchions are, are clearly designed to uh, work with the forms of the building itself. Mm -hmm. uh, this was one of a, of a number of studies that we did on the tower. And this, one of the key problems was the positioning of the mechanical floors, uh, which are the two bands at about the quarter point, and then the detail. We didn't want to put louvers in, and what finally worked were simple slots in the granite. This slide should have been with the other. It was an alternate of the base condition. Uh, this was a uh, study of the, uh, of the way we brought air into the mechanical floors. There are no louvers that are visible in the building. This was a detail of the um, of the mullion system around the glass. In this, in this case, we did not choose this. this. This had to do with whether the aluminum would be flushed or the kinds of options you get into were whether the glass plane and the granite plane, the relationship between the planes of the three key materials on the facade. Um, the aluminum always had to precede the glass in order to hold it in. And there were options of making the glass flush with the granite, uh, not flush with the granite, and so forth. And that, that may sound like a triviality, but but uh, the difference of a quarter, literally of a quarter of an inch, could have, would have had a very profound effect uh, on this facade, because the facade is essentially a flush and polished one. Uh, another. And, and these are very simple, but very effective tools. Well done right in, you know, just you know, right in the graphic room. Uh, this was a study that we did of the backing pavilion. It was actually a quadrant model, and we used mirrors to uh, look at a whole series of different Thank relationships. Being able to look at the building construction, uh, take it apart, and it was a, a, a mountable model. We actually, uh, it was one of the most useful models that we built. All very homemade. Uh, these were studies that we did for different lighting fixtures in the in the uh, banking pavilion, the main um, C 
ceiling. Uh, as we got more in parallel to the whole architectural development, was a very um, uh, elaborate um, interiors program that we did. And uh, very frequently, we would make architectural evaluations simultaneously with interior work. The second floor of the building is actually their international bank. And we were quite concerned about certain proportions and visibility of certain furniture. Again, I think a lot of this will come clear when you see photographs of the finished building. Um, what I'll show you now are a series of the interior models that we did. This is one of a whole series of floors. And uh, this was not, so this is a presentation model. Um, we also did another view of that model. We would also do fairly conventional uh, materials plans and so forth, but we found by far the models were the most uh, effective way of getting a point across. It's not so much to sell a design point, it's just to have all of the all of the people, and there were literally hundreds of them involved in having an understanding of the way their spaces were going to work. Uh, we got into this kind of thing. Uh, one of the um, less pleasant parts of the whole experience is that about midway through, it was decided to use our plans, but in the um, working areas of the bank, simply to the, the, the bank was going to decide to purchase uh, their own furniture. It was for a visual point of view a catastrophe, but the, the key public areas remained in our hands. Uh, this is a model of a, one of the of a small sitting room that is in the International Bank in the core. Uh, this is one of the executive offices. Kind of thing. These were models built by us. And when we got into really key decisions, we would have mock-ups made. This is a, a detail of one of the paneling systems that was used uh, in their executive area. Uh, when, we, when we got it to the point that we liked it, you know, then we presented it and uh, we accepted it right away. We got into uh, studies of the elevators, this kind of thing. Lighting, this was an operating mock-up. The lighting effect of work. Actually, the slide is sideways. And finally, uh, for some of the furniture presentations, we would um, actually get the furniture and set it up and have people all uh, sit down and, and, and so forth. Uh, this was a kind of freewheeling presentation. We used the, uh, the second floor of a building that we were doing that was under construction primarily to get a sense of scale because there were no existing spaces available that had the right kind of scale to them. Uh, I'd like to conclude with a fairly fast series of slides to give you some sense of the product of that process. The sculpture that was finally uh, selected was a piece that was done by a Japanese sculptor named Masayuki Nagari. So it's a very beautiful piece. Uh, since these slides were taken a couple of years ago, the, there's been a very heavy program of putting flowers and a couple of very beautiful flagpoles and kiosks. Uh, around to uh, certain edges of the plaza, and uh, I think um, very pleased it's a very successful space. Quite honestly, when we first put it in, it didn't, it didn't really come from off, and it, and it needed more work to get the right scale. This is another view of that piece. This is a shot coming up the building from not, from not from the plaza side, but from the other. And it really has quite a magical quality. I don't know if any of you have been to San Francisco or you have what your view of the building is. But it's a very responsive building. Uh, there are times of day when it really doesn't come off at all. There are other times of the day when it's, uh, it's absolutely glorious. It's a, it's a very interesting building from that point of view, what light does to it. So this is where you begin to see, you know, this is the product of all those little cardboard studies. This is the second floor of that international uh, banking space. You may remember one of the earlier models. The, they're very, very pleased with it. And I'm, I'm happy, I'm delighted to say that we were just awarded the commission for the two main data centers, uh, just announced last week, which will be an even larger project than this one. So we have quite a good relationship with these people. And again, the second floor. This is their top floor, their executive area, the paneling system that I showed you a lot of, uh, one of those offices. They're 
quite a conservative group of people, and for, for us, a very difficult design problem was to, you know, they, they really wanted the whole thing done in traditional uh, Georgian panel and just call it a day. And uh, what we finally came up with was a um, bringing together the best of the old and the new, which is uh, an attitude which I find always works, no matter you know, what the period was, as long as it's good, it usually goes together with something else. Uh, this is a <coughs> this is their main conference room, the management uh, room. And uh, we did the cafeteria in a, quite a different spirit. Very, really, a lot of uh, nice place to have lunch. And I think this is the closing slide of, uh, of the last uh, another area on that floor. So that's it, and I hope I've been able to give you some idea of what it takes to. Um, I don't know what the format is. I think perhaps you can, you know, we just we'll both talk and then we'll have to come down some time so we can all talk together. So I'll give you the to step it out. Short and sweet, too. Thank you. Hack and I talked last week, and we decided that it would be best if we tried to show some diverse examples of the work we're doing with SOM. Mark out of San Francisco, myself out of Chicago. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we were approached by a developer around Chicago to get involved in a project with him, uh, adjacent to what is now the largest shopping center in the world. It has in it uh, a Sears store that, at this point in time, is the most successful Sears store in the world. It's a community of about 600,000 people, uh, projected to be about 1,200,000 people by 1985. And he had gotten this land under option with a corporation called the Union Oil Corporation out of Los Angeles uh, with the intent of developing an office park. He was primarily an industrial developer, the yeah, president of Marshall yeah, Bennett. Uh, and he had as his partners in the venture a group of people, <laughs> including Union Oil, and another group of people uh, who are known as the Pittsburgh family, who happened to own the Hyatt House chain, amongst the many other holders. <laughs> So it made the nucleus for what we constituted a fantastic opportunity. The real issue is that he had gotten the option on this land on the basis of uh, some performance characteristics in terms of economic performance characteristics that related to about 2 million square feet of office space only. And this area is in a regional area that I think best start with the slides. An area, an area called Schomburg, Illinois. That's not the focus of the movie. Schomburg, Illinois, which is a population center northwest of Chicago, about seven or eight miles north, further northwest than O'Hare Field. It's centered in a population center, as I described, of about 600,000 people and projected to uh, grow to about a million, 200,000 people by 1985. Its only semblance of an urban core is a shopping center with 10,000 cars on the exterior of it. Our goal was to, at this point in time, to test out his performer, as he termed it, for a, an office park, but also uh, to define the design potential of the site itself, which turned out to be quite a bit different. The property itself is, is the Union Oil Regional Headquarters, which was physically acquired in an acquisition of the Pure Oil Company back about six or seven years ago. And Union Oil, who bought the Pure Oil Company for most of its pipeline holdings, uh, really didn't realize what they had. They had 240 acres of land, uh, and probably the most primary in the country. 
the fastest growing region in the country, uh, second only to Orange County, California, which is Los Angeles County, and has an income base higher than Orange County, California. It has an income base of about fifteen and a half thousand dollars per family. The facility itself, uh, the existing facility, is a Union Oil headquarters, which is a two-story, relatively new building sitting in the center of the site with the remainder of the 243 acres in green open space and some parking facilities. The Woodfield Mall on the left, on the bottom part of the slide, as I stated before, is the, the only semblance of urban core. The rest of it is really kind of a suburban sprawl with a major Cook County Forest Preserve, um, slight industrial parks, apartment complexes that look like trailer parks on the top, uh, and some regional headquarters for things like Western Electra, Squibbon, Western Electric, Squibb Incorporated, uh, Northern Illinois Gas. <laughs> the first stage of the process, which we're physically uh, at that arrow right now, and we haven't really designed a, 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 a development yet, we've gone through the testing process and the, and the proving out of the economics in conjunction with a series of people. We were hired at this point in time, SOM constitutes the red uh, lettering on that chart. Uh, the yellow lettering is uh, Real Estate Research Corporation out of Chicago uh, that did all the market and feasibility studies. Uh, Union Oil, the, the venture Union Oil, uh, did most of the initial concepts for the joint venture. And uh, the green indicates developer, developer contact. And the blue in the, in the middle is our input of uh, a cost consultant or a contractor known as Tishman, who is probably the largest contractor in the world. We'll go through each step of this process and bring you to the point in time where we are right now. The first stage was our conceptual development done in conjunction with real estate research market study. We had at this point in time uh, very little input in terms of the market demands. So we went through uh, a series of studies, the regional analysis, the gathering of the planning data, and the preliminary component program, which was all done in a vacuum and in sort of an isolated form without having a direct input of market and market uh, demand. The land use projections uh, showing the 1972 projections on the left with the site in the gray area in the center and what's expected by 1990. These were uh, gathered through the regional planning of departments of the various counties and you can see that we lie right in the middle of a major urban center with uh, two, um, a tow road system on the north and a, a super highway on the, on the west, really two basic arteries that are overcrowded at this point in time on the uh, south and on the, on the west. This drawing on the uh, on the left shows kind of the regional influences, the basic makeup of the surrounding area. You can see the interchange in the center, which is directly adjacent to our site. The green open space, which is County Forest Preserve, dedicated forest preserve, which can never be built on. The impact of the Woodfield Mall and the other uh, commercial entities to the south. Uh, the brown being light industry, and the remainder of the of the region is essentially residential. Two drawings here to find basically the topography and the soil conditions of the site, a basic floodplain zone to the north of the site, but all other forms of utilities directly related to the site are accessible. A new 90-inch sanitary interceptor sewer that's bisected, in fact, has been built on the site since we've started to work on it. The next step was to really start to catalog a series of uh, isolated independent studies of various components. We took a look at, at housing as, as residential units. We took a look at commercial entities and hotels at office buildings and industrial issues. And we decided from the offset that industry uh, was not compatible with what we wanted to put on the site. These were a series of density studies just defining the use of high rise and low rise buildings, establishing spacing and distances between buildings based on, on height and uh, volume. 
in the plan. We found that by manipulating configuration, we could achieve higher densities. And keep in mind that our goal was, at this point in time, to build an urban core, not an extension of the suburban system. So we went through a series of density studies. The next step was to take a look at the hotel and its functional form. And these are, are, are really a series of slides excerpt out of a, in a sense, a dictionary of studies that we did. And they, they don't have a strong relationship to each other at this point in time. This was, in a sense, a bubble diagram showing the, the, the guest circulation system in a hotel and its relationship to various functions on the left. The hotel room on the right, its relationship to sleeping area, to orientation, and uh, room area in terms of net to gross ratios as related to single and double occupancies. The issue of, of commercial and service requirements as related to uh, accessibility in terms of pedestrian accessibility, uh, commercial design standards and based on general tenant areas, the issue of, of ceiling heights and depths of lease span as we refer to the, the physical dimension that is best rentable in terms of a developer. In terms of the office building, we have in our office uh, a program, a computer program that we call a building optimization program. It's a functional tool that we use to define optimization of an office building. Uh, it's an issue of putting into the, the computer a series of basic inputs relating to site, the constraints of the site, the code constraints, tenant requirements, the economics, the schedules, and we go through a series of manipulations to come out with what we call an SOM evaluation and a client evaluation. This is a series of solutions that we, we output it's controlled by the, the input at the top of design limits. We try to limit, for example, we would manipulate the, the module from a five foot uh, module to a six foot module. We, we manipulate the minimum and maximum in terms of gross floor area to 5%. And we target the area of the building we want. Then try to define really um, out of this a series of lease spans which relate to traditional tenant office space, and we, have, we print out a series of, of solutions, and that tells us which solution is the least cost, it tells us which solution is the, uh, the least cost per square foot, and which solution is the maximum return on investment. Now, the maximum return on investment is a relative cost because it has a lot of functional relationships to taxation and land costs and things of this nature. But we did go through a series of programs that allowed us to take a look at at what we felt were applicable for the site. First of all, we felt out in that area that buildings of more than 300,000 square feet were not rentable uh, in terms of major tenants. In addition to that, a floor area of, of, of maybe 15 to 20,000 square feet was the maximum. It's very difficult to get major large tenants in a, in a community that's uh, primarily suburban at this point in time. But these types of, of engineering data allows us to go through um, basic structural input, heating and ventilating cost input, and going through the breakdown or the distribution of costs in a building. For example, at this point in time, uh, overall building costs of $32 a square foot. This would include uh, a base building or a shell building with uh, basic input for tenant improvements or tenant developments of about $5.73 a square foot. This gave us enough criteria to develop programs for uh, the office component of the development. The recreational use of the development, we tried to categorize the recreational components into um, outdoor recreation and playgrounds, landscaped open areas, indoor athletic club activities, community center type activities, and indoor amusement type activities. We then tried to, to take each one of these components and try to establish a, it's a strong relationship to the various form-giving components of the site, the residential components, or uh, auto parking, for example, or pedestrian circulation, and package these into a series of clusters to get physical areas. For example, uh, a cluster of these types of components would constitute a tennis club facility. Testing out this tennis club, we found that uh, a minimum of eight courts was the most viable tennis club facility that we could develop. 
In this case, we, we went into a matrix of outdoor uh, tennis type facilities and actually recreation and cultural use facilities. Trying to establish a maximum usage of these types of facilities for various ac activities, whether it were special interest type activities or general interest type activities or single use activities, for example. And this, again, here again, was being done in a vacuum to really establish, a, in a sense, a dictionary of, of uses and components. <clears throat> we did the same thing for transportation systems, trying to categorize in matrix forms you know, what type of, uh, of transportation systems would apply to the site itself. We took a look at uh, various types of parkings, real parking, realizing that uh, we ultimately ended up with about 14,000 cars on 100 acres which in itself on one surface would take about two to three times the, the total area. So we had to address ourselves to various forms of structured parking. Here again, the, the extension of the parking analysis, which related to uh, establishing basic limits for ramp condition, basic alternatives for parking stall widths, which related back to code restrictions and things in the area. The next attitude was to go through and try to try to establish really uh, a physical relationship in the form of, of our terminology of strong linkage, weak linkage, or some component relationship, which was really the residential relationship to itself in those terms. But then to establish a strong uh, component relationship with the various major components on the site, residential as related to to uh, commercial, residential as related to the office component. And on the, on the uh, slide on the right, really two basic diagrams establishing the major relationships and the major uh, interferences based on noise, visual interferences, or traffic interferences. This slide has to be upside down. I apologize. This allowed us to really establish a theoretical model for the site. And with residential on the left and the office component on the right, and its need for privacy in terms of residential and its need for accessibility for the office component. The, the linkage elements now become really the commercial, cultural recreation elements and a stronger relationship of the hotel to the, to the office system. We tried to package this, this um, physical uh, theoretical model of the site into two, ba two basic categories. A linear system, and we inserted the issue of, of vehicular circulation, and the issue of privacy in terms of parking. And we also did it in the form of a radial system, where most of the leak elements in the center became three-dimensional elements. We then took a look at <clears throat> these basic components and how they would relate on the site. We tried to establish uh, the first system as a branch road system, utilizing the two arteries that we could really uh, have access off of. We tried to show, by, by just penetrating the site, what could develop on the site, with the components in, in gray, the linkage elements becoming the red, and the open space being green, circulation in white, and the phase one diagram, which is the first 104 acres. A spine road system, which just bisected the site on the right, we went through the same parameters. a peripheral road system which really kind of inverted or interoriented the whole site uh, to a system of combining a spine and peripheral road system which gave us the flexibility in terms of development for an inner orientation and an external orientation which we felt at this stage was necessary in terms of what uh, the goal we were trying to achieve. We also we then went through another series of matrix systems and the slide on the right has an error in it the, the nodal and external generator systems are reversed on the slide itself. Um, we tried to establish really a, based on uh, a site analysis in terms of uh, the nodal issue or the edge issue in terms of uh, termination of certain districts on the site and the issue of generators in terms of internal or external generators. We tried to establish a physical attitude towards the site itself, which is indicated on that slide. The next area of development was done by Real Estate Research Corporation with, with our basic uh, input being done in the, in the development of the slides we just went through. Real Estate Research uh, Corporation was hired to really 
uh, evaluate the catchment area or the, the, the marketability of the site itself, the demographic profile and the preliminary market demands. We'll go through a series of, of slides for the, the, the response to the information that they develop. The catchment area is really the 10 township study area that's indicated in yellow. And we show really the secondary trade area and the primary trade area and what we could expect from, from these types of trade areas. Uh, it shows the customer study area, 350 square miles, uh, which I stated before, the fastest growing sector in Chicago metropolitan area. 600,000 people, which is the 1970 population. It's about 650,000 people right now. And the various statistics that relate to the catchment trade area. This was an assemblance of types of programs that they were starting to project to us. You can see on the right, um, they projected in a typical development what the market would be in terms of residential usage. They also did the same for maximum potential. If the concept was strong enough to attract people, the potential would increase. So this became our goal. After the, we went through these first steps, we decided really to test out uh, what each of these components was in terms of, of goals and potentials. And we started talking to a lot of people. We traveled around the country and talked to the Club Corporation of America in terms of recreation. We asked them on the basis of their experience, what could they project, project based on, on the market projections that we had just uh, achieved. We went to Centex Corporation in terms of residential, Jerry, Jerry Hines and Houston in terms of the commercial and office market. Uh, Tishman Construction in terms of construction management and also in terms of the office and residential markets. The Hyatt Corporation in terms of the hotel. Residential, we went to the Inland Robbins Corporation, which is a, a Midwestern-based corporation, and the Urban Investment Development Company in terms of commercial. And on down, down the line, we tried to get an assemblance of what the projections might show and also what the physical developers, other than our, than our own client, might project. The next step was to take a look at the projected uh, or the component character. The hotel itself, uh, immediate competition around the area itself. I mean, it's very difficult to see in the slides, but it shows about 1,900 existing hotel rooms in the immediate area, 200 under construction, about 500 proposed. So where airport concentration itself is about 7,400 rooms existing. hotel market, we went through a, a series of, of studies re relative to the, the advantages of a proposed hotel and what, might, what we might expect, the hotel character on the right, the sources of guest traffic. And these were all used in evaluating the market studies. The office market, we went through a similar type of analysis showing the existing market system that uh, in this 10 township study area, basic um, office systems proposed and projected for the big, for that region. And here again, the physical character of the office market. I think I'll move on a little faster because these are very yeah. difficult to read. Commercial recreation market, we went through the same type of analysis, trying to evaluate what existed in the region and what might be projected. Character that we might start to pursue. Retail, the same type of study. Retail market and the retail market character. The same for residential its basic component. Parking, we went through an analysis of the various forms of parking for the site itself. We tried to categorize really um, what the uh, parking demand was, the greatest demand for parking being at uh, 10 a.m. And, uh, and the basis of percentage for each uh, residential, office, commercial, and hotel component. 
we decided to go through an analysis of shared parking systems to see where we would end up. We took uh, the basic criteria for each component in terms of parking. We took a look at uh, no shared parking and what it meant in terms of parking spaces per, let me see if I can get that a little clearer, what it meant in terms of shared parking spaces. Uh, we superimposed in the yellow form on the bottom all the residential parking, which we felt could not be shared by any other component. We then overlaid, really, uh, the next, the other components. Slides keep popping out of focus, I apologize. We superimpose the, uh, the commercial, recreational, uh, and office market, and try to establish the amount of cars we could save, or the amount of parking spaces we could save, by using a space more than once. You can see the basic demand for all those components with no shared parking was about 17,000 cars. Whereas by sharing parking spaces, by utilizing parking spaces in the evening for entertainment that were utilized during the day for, for the office potential, we could really, in a sense, save about uh, three to 4,000 parking spaces. <coughs> The next step was for us to go through a series of preliminary schematic designs with the site development, the basic systems analysis, and the component programming. This was, uh, as Mark spoke earlier, the evolution uh, was, was generally shown at the end. But this was a, the evolution of a series of quick sketch studies and the, the creation of a, a concept. It really doesn't define any specific component. It's a concept by which we can now start to apply uh, the basic information that we've been studying at the beginning. Uh, but what we had to do was to define this concept in a form that would excite people and start to develop an attitude towards the maximum potential of marketing. We took and defined really a central mall in the center, which is a layer of a commercial, not competing with the major urban shopping center, or suburban shopping center across the street, but creating a form of a specialized type of commercial, a form of entertainment which relates more towards this region than anything else. Uh, the purple or the, the magenta in the center is really commercial. The yellow on the left is a couple of villages of housing, both high and low rise forms of housing. Uh, blue is, is a water based form of recreation. It also is about a 10 acre retention system, which uh, by law now in Form of recreation. It also is about a 10 acre retention system, which uh, by law now in, in this county in Illinois you're required to, to retain all storm runoff. The small forms of, of yellow over the commercial are special forms of residential, uh, such as apartments over shops and systems of this nature. <coughs> The purple itself is the basic office development with <clears throat> special forms of office development to the right, the smaller types of office development that need their own identity, such as corporate type headquarters. <clears throat> the red being recreation, clustered on the top of major parking systems, utilizing that as, as indoor forms of tennis or other forms of recreation, and spreading its way through outdoor water-based forms of recreation for the residential. And the form in the center became, became the focus or the hotel system, which utilized all this form of recreation and commercial uh, usage as its, its major attractor. The slide on the right is an oblique slide of the, of the, uh, the basic model that developed the concept. <coughs> the system itself was really a series of, of above that horizontal dotted line of standard off, uh, components be it either office, residential, um, commercial, or recreational components that really sat on top of a series of infrastructure components that we had to then set out to define. Uh, we show a, as an example uh, the Alcoa building in San Francisco that Mark works in and uh, is clustered around a series of systems that really are kind of early stages of this whole concept. Then went through to define really in order to uh, test out the viability of this concept we felt it necessary to without physically designing the 
the concept, to go through a series of specifications, just making assumptions and, and putting down a series of criteria specifications that somebody could physically price out. In this case, it happened to be Tishman. He went through and took each component to define really the criteria that related to each component, be it low-rise residential or high-rise residential, the engineering aspects of it, the site utilization aspects of it. <coughs> we tried to define in character what this could, could be. Uh, here again, some rough sketches of, of various forms of residential, water-based recreation, water-based uh, commercial entities, other forms of, of uh, recreation and cultural usages, other forms of residential uses, um, more uh, formal types of, of residential components, as, uh, such as selling um, in Sweden or uh, Habitat up in, in Expo. We did the same for the hotel. We went and tried to define the criteria relating to the hotel in terms of its, its program, input in terms of engineering. relationship to special forms and special character to be an attractor for the, the central focus of the whole concept. Other forms of, of the hotel related to commercial entities. We did the same for the commercial systems. We went through a criteria specification for the commercial uh, connector spine in the project. Its usage various forms of entertainment, dining, similar to the Galleria in Houston. Special uses of uh, a commercial, such as the Heritage Village in Connecticut, where really it's a, a, an entity that's rented totally. It doesn't have any physical quarters going through it. When commercial was used, we wanted to really try to define it as a special form of commercial. Again, the commercial spaces relating back to the public spaces, <coughs> such as Giardelli Square in San Francisco. The indoor uh, recreation, again, starting to cluster recreation on tops of major parking structures, connecting it through the hotel, letting the hotel become really the link element for all various forms of recreation. Again, defining the criteria that relating to each one of these recreational components. Of, of indoor and outdoor forms of recreation. Office specifications, uh, going back into the, the criteria specification of a basic office component that would exist on the site. Utilizing special forms of office facilities but still connecting them back into the, the total complex uh, to take advantage of the amenities that would be provided. Parking specifications, the, the finalization of the basic distribution of parking. We took, for example, our 14,000 cars and said uh, uh, we can expect, first of all, not to achieve any revenue off of commercial parking. It's very difficult to expect somebody to shop and pay for a parking space. So we allocated most of our surface parking to the commercial component. What was ever left, we then went to the hotel component, although we could physically uh, uh, have, expect a revenue off of a hotel parking. The remainder went to the office space. Covered surface parking was applied to the residential component, both in the form of uh, uh, two-level structured parking. And the remainder of the structured parking was applied to the office component. But we can't expect a revenue office to be able to pay for a, a covered parking structure in a development of this nature is a very uh, delicate system. We tried to show just in, in very schematic sectional profile how these systems would work, clustering all forms of, of recreation and commercial usages on top of the basic parking system, letting the hotel or the major attractor out areas come, come down to grade to start to bring the people up to a series of, of levels, and then really creating a new ground plane within the concept of the whole system. The next step was to take a look at the site itself and try to address ourselves to physically how we would um, make some assumptions and define the criteria specifications for the site. We broke the site into a series of five categories. The primary meadow, as we termed it, secondary meadow, primary urban, 
urban landscaped areas and parking lot areas. You can see on the right an allocation of surface parking. That physically is an easement that projects through the site for the sanitary uh, district sewage system that goes below the site. Uh, we allocated a certain portion of each, of each one of these categories and then tried to define what the criteria might be for each one of these categories. We took, for example, primary meadow and said it had a certain capability for shade trees, for small trees, for shrubs. Uh, we took and blocked out the basic multiplier or the amount of land that allocated itself to that. We came up with a total total uh, cost for that part of the site. We, tried, we did the same for each one of those basic categories, and then we tried to show in profile what the character of this might be, so that the cost consultant, or Tishman in this case, would have some type of realization of what they were pricing. The next step was to address ourselves to uh, another form giver on the site, uh, the retention system took a look at the basic form of the retention system, calculated its basic uh, area, and the, what we termed the hard edge, or a physical uh, a formal edge, related to the, the residential component on one side, calculated its length, and put a profile of what it might be on there. We did the same for what we termed the soft edge. The slide on the right shows just a superimposition of the basic traffic studies from, from a, a traffic consultant showing basic four-lane arteries, three-lane arteries, two-lane arteries, basic circulation system for the site, colonial footage, and what it meant in terms of magnitude for circulation systems. Uh, the drawing on the left is one of a series of uh, studies for the basic um, water distribution system for the site, showing the basic um, content of uh, piping distribution system, uh, utility system, water supply in terms of quantities and sizes on the right. Utility system, just superimposing again a site lighting system on the right. It's related to an electrical distribution system and costs. Uh, we superimpose on this uh, the slide on the left uh, a basic energy system for electricity and gas. Uh, at this stage, we, we have to make assumptions in terms of availability. Uh, we went through an analysis on the right of the basic uh, energy system. Finally, we, we, we started to superimpose on this distribution system. We, we also didn't, I'm not showing these. Again, I stated our slides or extracts out of a, a specification manual for the site. This happens to be, a, as we termed it, a goods and service distribution system. With an integration of, of a central receiving area, we took all these basic components and clustered all the code requirements for shipping and loading dock requirements for the office buildings, for the residential components, into a central system. Then cluster that with a, a service distribution system for the basic uh, utilities such as cold water and steam, or chilled water and steam, and integrated in uh, a, a tunnel distribution system for goods and service. Uh, as we went through the whole concept, we started to evolve new businesses that could be generated off the site, mail distribution systems, goods and service distribution systems, all forms of this, these types of things. Finally, we took a look at the site distribution itself. We said uh, we're going to have to, to distribute land in terms of its uh, magnitude and cost towards each component to uh, see whether that component is a viable um, entity. Uh, we said one physical way of doing it is dividing it up in, in a plan way exactly where it sits. But that gave the hotel the biggest advantage since it was in the center. It really um, uh, assumed the smallest amount of land. So we took another look at way of doing it, we took the physical ground that each one of these components sat on, and that's allocated in a series of numbers on the top. We then took the remaining portion of land and allocated it on the basis of, of its percentage of the program and came up with a, an alternative distribution system. We did all of this really to allow uh, Tishman to cost out the whole project. And you can see here we have a series of, of, of columns that find residential, hotel, commercial, uh, recreation, and cultural usages. Uh, the column on the left defines the basic ex excavation costs for these components, the landscaping costs, the roadway costs, the exterior lighting, and on, all on down. This is a recap of most of the costing systems with physical uh, 
uh, bid proposals from various contractors on these components based on those documents. The total cost of the project, you can see on the lower right hand corner, $177 million. This is basic construction cost. This allowed us now to, to start a series of costing analysis of the whole project. Real estate research went through this, but here again, a very close relationship with ourselves and the cost consultant and the physical developer itself. The physical relationship has to, has to occur at this point in time because there are a series of inputs that have to occur and they have to be assumptive at this point in time. For example, we have to start to make decisions in terms of, of phasing, in terms of what portion of the site development out of those costs we would extract out and apply towards the first stage of development. went through a series of, of computer studies showing a year-by-year -year analysis, and this is just one of a series of analysis. This happens to be rental units. We started out with a program of 3,500 rental units, ended up with 500 rental units that we converted to a condominium form after seven years. Physically, because you can see on the bottom line here about the fifth column, or the third column, a minus 59. That's a projection of the income that the developer can expect after these 500 rental units are built and online and fully rented. It's a function of taxation, it's a function of the cost, it's a function of the increased uh, vacancy ratios that exist. All these things tend to uh, make a project either profitable or not. The, the key on the right shows what each one of these line items are. And we went through a series of, of developments in the, in the computerized programs, uh, manipulating these developments to crank in starting with 3,500 uh, rental units. We did the same for condominiums. We did the same thing for the office space, the same thing for the commercial entity, the same thing for recreational components. Then we started to put them all together. This is a series of diagrams that we did showing components as they're built per stage. You see the total project starting with year one, a series of, of square footages, starting with a million square feet by year two, to 3 million square feet at the end of year two. Uh, we show basically a comparative gross square footage analysis and how we would tend to, to phase this over the, a number of years, I think it's 20 years in this projection, and a recap of the gross square footage on the bottom. Through this analysis, uh, Real Estate Research Corporation came up with this series of diagrams showing uh, basic um, bar chart showing the cash flow of a total project of this nature. Here again, utilizing uh, 14,000 parking spaces, for example, of which about 12,000 are structured parking. We show basically a cash flow which is in the positive form above the line zero, starting from year two. But you can see the components that really uh, give us some problems at the beginning. The residential component in the form of, of, of rental units. The residential component in the form of condominiums, for example. Um, are the part of the project that carry the basic uh, financeability of the project for the first um, 10 to 11 years. Then we gradually move in as the, market, as the, as the office market becomes stronger, we gradually uh, move into the basic development of offices. You can see here the hotel for the first number of years is really below the line in terms of cash flow, negative cash flow. Well, the basic assumptions that allowed this to happen were first of all 1974 values in terms of income in 1974 values in terms of, of cost. It's the only thing we could assume. We couldn't really project into the 15 year future any forms of inflation. But the hotel itself is an inflationary object because it's a function of manipulating on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, cost is related to occupancy. For example, uh, uh, the occupancy of a hotel, if it is high, then the cost of the room will be high. If the occupancy is low, the cost of the room will be lower. We couldn't really uh, inter interject any of these forms into the analysis, uh, basically because we didn't take into effect any inflation in this diagram. The diagram on the right shows the basic cumulative cash flow of the project itself. Now these are, I, I show these uh, basically to show the, the total involvement of the architect in terms of urban planning system, its input in terms of what the projected, uh, its projected future will be. This was another diagram that real estate, real estate research went through showing basic income projections, cost projections, and what they termed the sensitivity analysis. And we start to manipulate, for example, by a 5% ratio up or down what the various uh, variables are in terms of income.
finally, the uh, stage that we're at right now where really um, this whole analysis allowed the, the developer to really consummate his joint venture with uh, the Union Oil Company and the Pritzker Group. That happens to be the joint venture at the top. We now are formulating really um, a development corporation. He's in the process of formulating a development corporation of which he will have to bring on board various uh, consultants, various component uh, consultants, project manager. We function as the red group, but really kind of an organizer of this whole format, uh, construction management group, and finally a series of contractors to develop this. We physically now uh, start the thought process for the, the, the development of the project as a physical plan. This is a series of studies, and uh, this is one corner of a chart where we really started stating our basic involvement in the organizational phase. I, I know you can't read that. But we've gone through a line item. Our involvement is the architect planner, uh, various marketing consultants, development group, legal consultation, management and leasing, and really a bar chart cranking in really uh, the aspects of the red being ourselves and our studies for the next nine months projected uh, for now a physical master plan and the staging conceptual design, physical form, on into construction, stretching out over a series of... Physically, the, the basic concept that we chose to pursue, and inherently its, its choice was based on the flexibility of starting to manipulate these basic components. That's essentially my part of the presentation. population center that exists um, size equivalent to the city of Denver, size equivalent to the city of Atlanta. And we felt that um, as we started to think about the problem, that really the generator for this total core, or the generator for this nucleus, will, which will in the future influence things like transit systems and systems of this nature that will start to eliminate pollution, the, the generator should have been the shopping center across the street. It's the major urban form giver to that total community. It has been to a number of communities, but um, since it didn't, uh, we had to address ourselves to what we felt could be visualized. Uh, we started out, we talked earlier you know, also about social planning and things of this nature. We feel that there's, there's a lot of input that has to be put into this. That happens to be the next stage, but before you can get to that stage, you have to develop a system that allows you to develop a viable project in terms of economics difficult for any one developer to build an urban core. Again, it's generally a series of developers. And that's why this, this man has really tried to bring together, he, he, he considers himself as a kind of an orchestrator of, 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 of other developers. He wants to bring together uh, a series of component developers, such as um, Jerry Hines, who built the Galleria, which is a successful system. Um, Tishman, who has built really successful office buildings in the country. Club Corporation of America, who is really the, the innovator in terms of recreational systems. But to start to cluster all these systems into a, a total project that can be a viable entity, viable both in terms of, of social goals and viable both in terms of economic goals. But he had to really prove to his partners to begin with that it was viable. The only way we could do that was to come to a quick concept of 
apply criteria to it that we could test out. Uh, now we go back with that criteria as our program to design the project. And we think it's a, a process that uh, instead of going through and designing a very fixed state or a, a, a very object-oriented system, and ending up with something that has to be compromised in the future as you start to build in uh, components that don't become uh, what the developer constitutes as, uh, as economically sound, uh, what other people constitute in, ter in terms of socially sound. We felt that we had to come to that point, uh, allow it to occur, and now start to design that system. So we don't really think it, I don't know if I've addressed myself to your question exactly, but we don't think it's really kind of a, a dreaming system. We, we think we've, and we've done it quite quickly. We did it in, all that process was gone through with the involvement of not a lot of people uh, and done in a very short time, six to eight months. Uh, and it's, it's, we haven't let the object itself become the issue. We've tried to let the criteria become the issue.